Well, as you can see by the first slide, the title of my sermon today or the, this evening is Philoxenos, which is a Greek word for love of strangers or what we commonly refer to as hospitality. So uh, in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, of course, when they talk about hospitality, this is the word that they use uh, and literally translated, it means the love of strangers. Uh, as, a, as a minister and his family, Lise uh, and I and our children, uh, one of the blessings, uh, especially having worked in, uh, you know, in a mission field in a place where uh, a very cosmopolitan city, city of Montreal, many, many cultures there. Uh, we've been able to offer hospitality to many types of people, I mean, from all over the world, uh, from Asia and Africa, the Caribbean, a couple of Americans, uh, uh, Indian people uh, from India, uh, just uh, Pakistani, and all, all Christians from, from all kinds of cultures have been in our home and in our congregation. It's been mentioned several times that back in Montreal, a congregation of about 100 people had maybe 16, 17 different language groups just in 100 people. So we were blessed by that and our children were blessed because they grew up you know, interacting on occasion with, uh, uh, with uh, people who were different than they were, different color, different language, different you know, societies, and it helped them to have a, a broader uh, view of, uh, of life and, and of the world. Well, uh, in order to motivate more of us here at uh, Choctaw to experience the very uh, special joy that comes with exercising this virtue, uh, I'd like to review what the Bible teaches, some of the things that the Bible teaches us about the love of strangers or hospitality. Uh, one of the first instances of hospitality recorded in the Bible is when Abram, he was still Abram, is uh, welcomed and given gifts in Egypt by the Pharaoh as a way of honoring Abram in order to take Sarai as his uh, you know, as wife. Uh, we know the story, Abram had lied about Sarai, saying that she was his sister in order to protect himself. Later on, we see Joseph, a descendant of Abraham, now a high official in the Egyptian court, welcoming his brothers and their families as strangers in that particular land. And in the same episode, we note that the Pharaoh, in honor of Joseph, offers his family great hospitality by giving them a place to live and the protection of the king while they are in his country. And so from this example, we see the carrying out of God's primary command regarding the giving and the nature of hospitality. Uh, we can read here at the top, but if you want to look in your Bibles in Deuteronomy chapter 10, Moses writes, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. And of course, that's a familiar thing. This is uh, repeated quite often in the Old Testament. So it seems that the, the idea of hospitality in these early writings was directed mainly uh, at the national level. How the Jews as a people were to treat strangers, in other words, non-Jews who came in among them. For example, in Exodus 23.9, we read, you shall not oppress a stranger, since you yourselves know the feelings of a stranger, for you also were strangers in the land of, of Egypt. You notice that God here is, is speaking to the people, of course, and it's not a kind of a high and mighty, uh, you know, ethereal, uh, hard to grasp notion that he's giving across here. He says, you know the feelings. You know, God is saying, you know what it felt like to be a stranger. You remember that feeling, he says, for once you were strangers in a, in a place. And I, you know, when visitors come, uh, usually they come in, in the morning, but uh, 
and, and I will greet them. And I, the first question I ask is, uh, do you know anyone here? Can I, can I help you find someone, a family member or a friend that may have invited you? And they say, no. And I said, you know no one here? They go, no, many times. No, I don't know anyone. We just moved or I just thought I'd come and visit. And I usually say to them, well, that's a very courageous thing that you did. I mean, think about that. We're so comfortable here, we know everybody, you know. But going to a church where you know no one, and especially, and sometimes I'll ask them, are you a member of the Church of Christ? Do you, do you understand how we do things? No, they say, no, I haven't gone to church much. I just decided that I'd like to come and visit. You know? Wow, what courage it takes. You, know, you don't know what the routine is. You don't know how people are going to receive you. And it really strikes me when God, way back in Exodus, it strikes the right tone there by saying, you yourselves know the feelings of a stranger. And then in Leviticus 24, another allusion to this, he says, there shall be one standard for you. It shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. And so uh, strangers were not to be uh, uh, prejudiced against uh, because they were a different culture or background. Their laws and, and attitude, the Jews now, their laws and attitude in dealing with strangers were to be the same as dealing with the regular citizen. I mean, that was established early on. Now Jesus incorporated the spirit of these ideas in Matthew 25, 35, when he said, I was a stranger and you invited me in. Notice he said, you invited me, come on in. To be kind and fair to the alien was part of the spirit of Christ, evident in his kingdom. And it should be evident in his kingdom uh, today. I like the idea of the welcome bread. I don't know who had that idea, and I know a lot of people bake that bread. What a great idea that is. And again, when I'm out front and I meet a stranger, you always look at their face when you hand them the welcome bread. And they, no one ever went, ugh. <laughs> you know. uh, instead of handing them a brochure about the church, when you we give them a brochure or something, which is necessary, uh, many times they go, oh yeah, okay, thank you. you know, and they'll put it in their pocket or stick it in their Bible or in the, the lady will put it in her purse. But when you give them the welcome bread, there's always a little extra reaction. They go, oh, you know, as if their mind is saying, well, that was nice, because why? Because it says that the people here anticipated visitors coming and gave the thing that is common to all people, bread. You know, who doesn't like banana bread? You know, maybe some of you are allergic to it, but you know, it's, a, it's a nice thing that we do. It's a small thing, it's just a small thing, but I've never seen anyone receive it without a smile on their face. And so the same attitude was the basis for the original you know, immigration policy for this country. And the attitude that made it so different and desirable as a destination for so many people around the world. You know, I believe God has blessed the USA because of this attitude and that while there should be safeguards, hear me, hear me right here, there should be safeguards against those who abuse this illegally, absolutely. You know, we should love our neighbor as how? Yeah, as we, love our, as we love ourselves. If I don't love me, I don't have the wherewithal to love you. But God, I believe, will continue to bless our nation because of our spirit of hospitality, even if we you know, guard some of it against um, abuse by, by so many people who attempt to abuse the goodness of, of this place. Now hospitality is not strictly an Old Testament idea. The thread of teaching on this important virtue goes on into the New Testament as well. For example, Jesus teaches about hospitality on a personal level, not just a national level. In Luke 14, 12 to 14, uh, teaches us some new concepts concerning hospitality, Jesus does, that we don't read about in the Old Testament. For example, he says you know, that inviting friends and family and those who can bless you because of the invitation, that's fellowship, that's not hospitality. 
The reward is the experience itself or what you gain from it. Nothing wrong with it, I'm not denigrating the idea of inviting friends and family to your house, but that's, that's not exactly the, the biblical concept of hospitality. That's fellowship. True hospitality, according to what we read in Luke, is receiving those who are strangers, those who don't bless you by their presence, those who need you, but you don't necessarily need them. This type of hospitality may cost more, uh, may be more inconvenient, may be less pleasant and uncomfortable, but God says we'll, we'll be rewarded by Him. You know, on a national level, this is when we let people in who are refugees or uh, medical emergencies or hardship cases or the homeless, the poor. On a personal level, it's when we deliver food or invite a stranger in church to dinner uh, or we make people who are different from ourselves feel welcome. This is hospitality, according to the scriptures. Remember the definition, the love of strangers. The idea of strangers is just, not just that we don't know them, it's the idea that they are different. That's why the loving of them is a challenge. They're, it's easy to love who is exactly like you. I mean, if they're white, if they speak English, if they come from Oklahoma, if they're members of the church, you know, if they're average height and average weight, there, there's not a lot of obstacles you know, to, to loving. But if the person is another color, whatever color, and they're wearing a mohawk, I know you can't visualize that, but <laughs> okay and they've got rings in their lips, and maybe they're tatted up a bit, and maybe you smell cigarettes on their breath. Now you've got a little bit of a hill to climb to get to that loving of that strangers. Remember we, we talk about this, I, you know, that sign that we had on 23rd, you know, sinners are welcome. Well, sinners, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes, brothers and sisters. They don't always look exactly like us. The Apostle Paul also teaches about the importance of hospitality in the, in the church. Paul says that the ability to do it well is a gift given by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you notice that, right? There are just some people, they just know how to you know, have you over to their house. They're just good at doing that. They're, they're good at offering a hospitality. I remember years ago when Lisa and I first came here, this is back in the 90s, I remember something that I hadn't seen before, and it was fun. Every Sunday night, there were four or five individuals in the congregation that that's where you went after Sunday night church. You know, I remember uh, going to the Hendersons, you know, that's where everybody went. A lot of people just went automatically to the Hendersons on Sunday night. They weren't even invited. <laughs> I used to feel bad for Nisi, you know. She was always, sure, come on down, you know what I mean? But she'd put in a long day. And people went there and, 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 and the thing was, they just felt good being there. And it wasn't just her, there were other individuals in the church. You know, half the church would, uh, you know, after services, they'd go to different people's houses. Now we kind of have to organize that, but back then somehow it was just natural. I believe that the Spirit gives to some individuals the ability to just be able to be welcoming and warm and they're able to absorb you know, people who are different than them and they do it so naturally and kindly. Paul also instructs the church to offer hospitality generously to those who minister in the church. In Romans 16.2 he talks about Phoebe, a Christian sister who had traveled a long way to deliver a message and he encourages the brethren in Rome to make sure that they offer that Christian woman and servant of the Lord to offer her hospitality when she's there. You know, in the first century, hospitality was a very important ingredient 
in the work of the church. Today it's a kind of, you know, come on over, we're having fun. But in those days you had traveling teachers and preachers and it was, it was very important that certain people in the church would offer those people hospitality so they would have a place to stay while they were teaching, while they were preaching, so on and so forth. And hospitality is seen as a, as a virtue possessed by those who are mature in the faith, something that takes time to develop but is a distinguishing mark of leadership. Interesting, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and in Titus chapter 1, verse 7, hospitality is listed as one of the qualifications for being an elder. Imagine, yes, the elder has to be apt to teach, of course, you know, and, and their conduct must be above approach, of course. And if we're going to trust these men with the, with the, with the good health of the, of the body of Christ, of the church, well, certainly we want to make sure that they themselves have done a good job with their families. You know? But then it says, and hospitality. That's also a mark, a requirement for those who will lead. An equal requirement, equal to you know, being apt to teach. In 1 Timothy 5.10, the qualification for a widow to receive help from the church was that she had been one who washed the feet of the saints, a way of saying gracious in offering hospitality. Peter encourages us to offer hospitality without complaining about it. He talks about you know, the attitude that we should have. If it's done with a happy heart, it is acceptable. And people can always tell if they are expected and welcome. <laughs> I've been to people's homes uh, you know, when you preach, you know, you, people invite you and you go. And um, I've been in people's homes, I, to, I walked in and the person said to me, what would you like to have for lunch? <laughs> let, let me set this stuff over here, you can sit there. No, it could have been a thousand reasons for that. You know, that it was busy, a kid was sick, you know what I'm saying. But if somebody invites you three days before to go over, you think maybe they might have figured out the menu, I don't know. I don't know. People can always tell though, not just by those things, but just the way that you're received. They can tell if you are actually not just expected, but welcomed. John in uh, 3 John verse five says that uh, hospitality is the clear indicator that one is walking in faith and love. It is the deed that proves faith. It is love and action, he calls it. Wow, it's not a minor virtue. It's not just a throw off thing. It's important. You know, we, we, we cannot grow as Christians and the church cannot grow as a body unless it loves strangers. Unless it loves strangers. Because all of us at one point were strangers when we came here. We moved to town, we, a friend invited us to church. It may have been a long time ago, but at one point we didn't know anybody. And I've always said, of course, it's the gospel that brings people into the church, but it's love that keeps them in the church. And a wonderful expression of that love is the act of hospitality. If as a church or a family or a person, we simply focus on ourselves and our needs, our own little world, we're going to shrink, we're going to die. Hospitality is that exercise that enables us to keep the doors of our church building, the doors of our homes and the doors of our hearts open to those that God will send us. Isn't it wonderful when God sends a family you know, she's been a Christian since she was a teenager and he became a Christian just before he married her and they've been married 20 years and they've got three kids and they're all in school and she teaches Sunday school and he's a terrific song leader and they decide to place membership and, you're, and they're generous givers. I mean, that's a win, 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 win situation. You're going, wow, how terrific is that? 
All preachers love when those people place membership, but not everybody is like that out there. Sometimes it's a single mom with two kids and she's wrangling those two little kids and she's got two jobs and she's late. And <laughs> it's not always easy welcoming the strangers. Many times the strangers have needs. And don't, you understand, don't we understand, because I include myself in this, people who come here, <laughs> no disrespect to Marty or myself or Mike, they don't come here to hear us. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't come in here and say, is your preacher any good? <laughs> don't answer that. <laughs> We can spread the blame, right, Marty? We can spread that baby out there. People don't come here for that. We're not that kind of a church, you know, with a superstar preacher on TV. And all. We're, we're, not, we're not, most churches are not like that. People who come here, they're looking for love because they've heard that Christian people love strangers. They've been taught or they've heard somewhere that Christian people will love sinners. That Christian people will overlook poverty, will overlook that you're not the best looking person, will overlook all those things because they're interested in the soul of the individual. And they're willing to make sacrifices in order to, to bring that person in and integrate them into the body. That's why they come here. People that have gone to another congregation, and again, I, I'm, again I'm not knocking any congregation, I'm not, I'm not even mentioning any names, but someone who's gone to X congregation over here for many years, then all of a sudden comes here. And, and you say, hey, hi, yeah, I go to X, okay, fine, you know, I just came to visit. And then they visit a little more and they visit a little more. What do you think they're looking for? They're looking, they're looking for satisfaction. They're looking to find perhaps a body of people that loves them better than they're being loved where they're at. Again, there could be 25 different reasons why they switch, but usually, usually, that's the thing. So important. Like I said, he doesn't always send us the people that are exactly like us, or already converted, or very nice to be with. That's what hospitality is for. The Christian form of love that is ready to love a stranger not based on how similar or likable she or he is, but love that person because this is what pleases our God and proves our faith. You know, I said sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. We had that sign up. I think this is the next sign we should put up on 23rd. My question is, are we ready to put that sign up? That's a big challenge to ourselves. But who would disagree that's that that is who we ought to be. The church of Christ is the church of love. Yes, there are other differences, but wouldn't it be wonderful is, if this was the outstanding feature of our congregation? Yeah, it's a nice building and it's convenient parking and the people are nice and you know, so on and so forth. We like the singing and the preaching is good. But the reason I stay here is because when I come here, I feel loved and I have the opportunity to give some love back. And I'm being trained on how to love more perfectly as Christ loved. Let's go for an example, shall we? Some concrete examples. In, Gen in Genesis 18 verses one to eight, Abraham gives us an example of hospitality in action. In these verses, we read what true hospitality consists of. And I'm talking now about the brass tacks, the nuts and bolts of true hospitality in any generation, in any place. So let's first, let's read the passage, shall we? We'll read verses one to five to begin with. It says, now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door 
in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him, and when he saw them, he ran from, his, uh, from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree and I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. And so just in these few verses we see you know, the kind of the nuts and bolts of hospitality. Hospitality, if you were to just look at this here, consists of several things. First of all, a gracious welcome. Note how Abraham greets his guests and convinces them that they are welcome in his home. You know, people need to feel a genuine and joyful welcome. They can be shown, or this rather can be shown in different ways that you're ready for them when they arrive, that food and other things are planned, not, 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 not the decision of the guest, uh, that the home and your appearance and the attitude, all of these things say, you've been prepared for. We were anticipating your coming. Another element, an eagerness to please. Hospitality is a godly thing and the joy should be obvious. People should feel that you really want them there and your attitude should show that their interests are what concern you while they are in your home. Have you ever been to somebody's house, you're the guest, you've been invited to somebody's house and you sit there for two hours and your, your hosts are doing all the talking. <laughs> your hosts are telling you about the time that the garage leaked and they ruined your car and that their son is a troublemaker and, and they go on and on and there's never a, a moment where a question crosses their lips that asks you about you. Have you ever had that experience? You know, part of hospitality is getting to know the stranger, finding out who are you. You're in my home, you're welcome, I'm happy that you're here, we're eating together, we're breaking bread, this is all good, but I, 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 you know, I want to know who you are. Tell me about yourself. Another element, sensitivity to real needs. The strangers were tired, in the story here, the strangers were tired and hungry and Abraham's task as host was to meet these particular needs. You know, sometimes the need is to feel welcome. Sometimes the need is to find a, a, an understanding ear. You know, it's not always food and it's not always rest. Sometimes the person just needs to kind of vent, needs to talk. The host's job is to find out what his or her guest needs and fulfill that as best as possible. Let's read a little more of this uh, verse here and then we'll, we'll grab a couple of other elements. It says, so Abraham hurried to the tent to Sarah and said, quickly prepare three measures of the flour, knead it and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant. He hurried to prepare it. And he took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. And so another element, Serve the best you have. I hear people say sometimes, oh, you can't come to my, oh, the house is upside down. Or we don't live in a very nice house. You know, our house is not as nice as your house. Or we can't serve prime rib. You know, we, we can't afford to serve. You know, the best you've got, whatever that is. Love gives its best without worrying about the competition with another person. Some won't offer hospitality because they feel that they don't have a nice home or fine food. But believe it or not, guests respond to love and enthusiasm, and if you've served your, the best in love, you've offered godly hospitality. Because what the, what the guest remembers about the hospitality is not necessarily the food, it's the people. That's what they remember the most. Number five. Hospitality is a family thing. In our family, when the kids lived at home and you know, they were younger, 
they had a job to do, they participated, they served the table and you know, they, they were having dessert, you know, Paul maybe or Julia would say, are you finished with that? Can I take that plate? You know, they were learning themselves how to host individuals and they enjoyed it. It, it was a grown up moment. It was a, you know, it was a mature thing to be on equal, you know, on equal par with mom and dad as a team. We were, we were making these people here uh, feel welcome. And one of the great joys that we have now as, as, as grandparents, and I'm sure the same experience you have, is going to our children's home and watching them with their spouses offer hospitality and to see that they're actually very good at it. You go to, the, even if it's Lise and I going over to, to maybe, let's say Paul's house to, to eat, well that Rachel, boy that table is set, you know, it's set before we got there and the food is cooking and the house is you know, ready and the kids are there to welcome us and it's just us. But they've learned the art of hospitality. So note in the passage that Abraham asked Sarah to work, uh, to cook rather, but he himself served and waited nearby while they ate. And so hospitality is not inviting your friends over so your wife can serve them, <laughs> brothers. <laughs> Husbands, wives, and children should all share in the responsibility and the joy of offering hospitality. In Luke 10, 33, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan and his efforts to help a stranger who had been beaten and robbed and left for dead. This story illustrates that strangers never arrive at convenient times, nor are they easy to know and accept. It's always an effort and expensive to show hospitality, but we ought not to offer to God or to strangers something that costs us absolutely nothing. And so in the end, God rewards those who love strangers. Abraham saved his nephew Lot and received good news about Sarah from the strangers who turned out to be angels. Rahab, the harlot who offered to hide the spies in her home saved her family and was counted in the genealogy of Jesus himself. Why? Because of her hospitality. In Ruth, I don't know if I've got this here, is it? No, let's go back. Um, in, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, where am I? Uh, she eventually married Solomon of the tribe of Judah and had a son named Boaz who married Ruth and uh, had Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, uh, through whom Jesus came. Imagine, Rahab, the harlot, in, in the direct genealogy of Jesus Christ. And what was the precipitating factor? She offered hospitality. And that wasn't just a fun thing she was doing, she was risking her life to do so. Mary and Martha, became Jesus' friends because they offered him their hospitality even when he was unpopular. And eventually he raised their brother Lazarus from the dead. And God will reward us as well in the practice of Christian hospitality. Strangers will be blessed and the church will grow and our capacity for love will increase bringing greater peace and joy into our, uh, into our personal lives. Our greatest reward, however, will be the fact that in the end, uh, our Lord will welcome us personally into the heavenly home. Uh, you might wonder, what, what's he showing us this for, this little gag here? It says, actually, Santa and I used completely separate lists. This little cartoon here, how many cartoons have you seen uh, uh, the pearly gates are there, and who's standing at the pearly gates? Yeah, Peter, right? They always say Peter at the pearly gate, but we know that it's not Peter at the gate to welcome uh, us, like all the jokes to say. It's the Lord Himself who welcomes us with those words that we long to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew 25, verse 21. And so my invitation tonight 
Are you still a stranger to the Lord? Will you be welcome into His heavenly home? You can guarantee that He will welcome you there if you welcome Him now into your life. You can do that by confessing your faith and repenting of your sins, being baptized into His name as some of our young people have done in the last week or so. And so I invite you to welcome Jesus into your hearts now or perhaps even invite Him back into your life because you may have been separated from Him for various reasons. If you have a need for ministry at this moment, we encourage you to come forward now and seek it as John leads us in a song of encouragement. Shall we stand please?